Welcome back to Stadium Unplugged with a two-time European Player of the Year, Kevin Keegan. Back in the day, you were really the first real, you know, superstar in your sport. Of course, oh, I can see you starting I'm to laugh. telling the truth. I can see you starting to laugh. So you're going to show no, some I'm clip. No, I'm not even laughing. You're going to show laughing. some clip I'm, of me. I'm actually telling you the truth because, uh, of course, the people of my generation will remember, um, you know, Beckham and you'll remember Cristiano Ronaldo and all that. But back then, you were the first real you know, sports superstar in uh, in England, at least in the sport of football. And well, you did George, endorsements. George Best was probably the very yeah. first, but he, yeah. George didn't turn up for anything. He used to, <laughs> so well, we all know what he was busy he, doing. He, he, but. Well, he, d he, he didn't care about money. He, mm -hmm. You know, he was a lovely, lovely guy and, a, and the, one of the greatest players you ever wish to meet, but, it, but he wasn't very reliable. So I just came on the back of him. So to say I was the first, George Best opened up the doors okay. and I was the next. And okay. of course, if you sort of followed what he did on a football pitch, if you possibly could, yeah and did the opposite to what he did off, which is boring, <laughs> you, you sort of, sort of worked. And, and I got a lot of his contracts, you know, okay. his boot contracts and everything. So okay. I wasn't the first. I'm sorry to, I, I know with you being Spanish, you, you'll probably... Um, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, first time on the show, I'm being called Spanish, but yeah. I'll take that one and go with it. But yes, you know, was it hard though managing, you know, uh, uh, of course that's going to be taking a lot of your time outside of football too, doing endorsements. It's not as easy as just saying, I'll turn up for a, for a shoot. You had to basically be a businessman almost on the outside. Was it a good balance? Yeah, a very easy balance for me because okay. again, Bill Shankly came over and he, he saw, uh, you know, he saw things starting to happen for mm -hmm. me very much. I got a newspaper column, I, I'd got mm -hmm. boots with my name on. Mm -hmm. This was all within about... Yeah. A year and a year and a half. Um, I'd also uh, got an advertisement to wear some cologne and that. Yep. And, and, and he came up to me and he said, uh, he just walked past me one day and said, "It's going well, son." He said, "Remember, mm -hmm. there's only one contract that really counts. Yeah. And that's your football one." And he just walked away. You know, so <laughs> that's how he was. It was it was only sound bites, but you know what he was trying to say is, don't forget, you might be enjoying this and going there and spending yeah. a bit of time there, and you see you on TV a lot now. But don't forget why mm -hmm. you're there. It's because you're playing football, you're playing for Liverpool, and you're playing well. So don't lose focus. So again, a real thing, right? He, he said, you just keep doing that right, playing football well, and there'll be more. They'll come. Mm -hmm. And and of course, he was right. Now you'd be able to look at all the other football stars who you know all have contracts and endorsements, mm -hmm. and you know they they seem to also live their life a lot more on the outside than on the football pitch. Do you ever think, oh my gosh, they've got it all wrong? No, I, and I don't envy them like some old players do. I, some old players criticise them. I admire what they... It's a different world now, you know. Mm -hmm. You can't compare what's happening to... what happened to David Beckham and what happened to... what is happening now to Messi and Ronaldo yeah. to the world I lived in, you know. The, the, this is 40 years has passed. Mm -hmm. You know, when I came to Malaysia, mm -hmm. people knew my name, but they hardly knew what I looked like because there wasn't the TV, the yes. exposure and things like that. So there was more a mystique about... Uh, famous players in those mm. days, people turning up at grounds mm -hmm. trying to get a look to see mm -hmm. just what, what, what is this guy like, mm. you know. So there was something nice about that, you know, there was something really nice. And of course, I think what we did better uh, than, than they do now is we, we really did get off a bus, have pictures with fans, sign autographs. We, we found time yeah. because that was part of our job, you know, uh, before and after games. Mm -hmm. And th th that's the only thing that disappoints me now. Uh, you know, they stick on a pair of headphones, the buses go under the stadiums, the players get on, mm -hmm. and the only time the fans really see them is when they've paid to watch them play football, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just think, and some players are better than others at it, but yeah. those players will lose in the end because they won't have the communication skills. That's, that's that's my big worry. But I admire him so much. He's a different game now, different pitches, different uh, boots. I mean, they don't have to wear those tight shorts we wore. You, know, you couldn't <laughs> run on those. Much to our long air, disappointment. Long air, you should slow you down. <laughs> but yeah, it's a different it's a different world. But what I've got to say is that there are some great players out there who you would have loved the opportunity to play with. Uh, let's talk about fans and you know how they gravitate to you. Uh, you've got Newcastle fans who mm. claim you to themselves, and then uh, Liverpool fans who definitely also have a, an affinity to you. But you've actually come out in numerous interviews saying that, of course, you gravitate closer to the Newcastle side of things. Yeah. Yeah. When I'm in Newcastle, let's say I'm Newcastle, and when no, uh -huh, I, see. I, I was with some Liverpool supporters here at the Cobra Club, and they're fantastic. And there are quite a, a lot of Newcastle fans here as mm -hmm. well, which you know, I mean, Liverpool I get because they've been a mm -hmm. lot more successful. But yeah. Newcastle fans, I think, just through the 90s, they they just became Newcastle fans because they enjoyed the the, the football that we're seeing, yeah. and uh, it can't be because we won anything because mm -hmm. obviously, as we know, we didn't. But um, the new the Newcastle setup is there because of a few reasons. One, my father was from there, so he was a Geordie. 
He used to always talk about Newcastle, so I had that from a, a young age. Also, my last playing club I retired, uh, played for was Newcastle. Yeah. And when they got up, I retired at 33. And of course, I went back and managed them. And, and so, I've had more to do with, with Newcastle, but Liverpool made me, you know, as a player. I've had nothing to do with them ever on the managerial side or anything like that. But as a player, meeting Bill Shankly and playing with that group of players absolutely took me from being a young boy to a man yeah. within a year, you know, and, and, and something that's helped me all my life work things out. So, um, you know, when, it, when I'm with the Liverpool fans, you know, they, they always, their memories are different. Their six years of playing. I mean, yeah. I was just, yeah. I was just 21 years of age when I went there. So, yeah. uh, you know, I was just a boy, really. Okay. Now, you've said that uh, you've got England's top job. You were, uh, you know, mm. the coach for England. And uh, you had said that it was a very soulless position to be in. And uh, you went on to say why it was, because you don't really actually have the players for a very long time. But why? Was it that bad? Yeah, I really didn't enjoy it. I mean, yeah. uh, people forget, you know, they just say, oh, you, you were England manager. You, I've got the worst record yeah. as an England manager. And, and, and that's true. Uh, but you know, I was asked to do a job because Glenn Hoddle went. I was I was working with Fulham. I took it part time, and I managed to get us qualified for a tournament. We were nowhere near enough, good enough to win. Mm -hmm. You know, we struggled to qualify. So mm -hmm. the signs are, unless we suddenly found some impetus or some new players from somewhere, we probably weren't didn't have the form going in to win anything. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't like about it, um, two or three things. I didn't like the FA meetings. I found them pretty boring. Yep. Um, the fact you had players, and uh, if you picture it, you, you pl you've got the top team, the England fans want them to do well. They arrive on a late Saturday night having mm -hmm. played. You can do nothing on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. The top teams play on a Sunday, so they don't arrive till late Sunday night. You can do nothing with them on a Monday. Yep. You're now into Tuesday before you've got your group together, mm -hmm. and you're playing Wednesday, so you can do nothing with them, really, other than a bit of tactical work, and because they're playing next night. So, and, and then the worst part of all is the minute you finish with them and you really want to sit down and say, right, let's look at where we can improve, mm -hmm. they're gone. And they're gone back to the clubs, rightly so, because that's who own them. And it might be three months before they come back again. Mm -hmm. And by that time, it's, it's hardly worth going through one because you've got the same thing again. They're mm -hmm. arriving late because they're big clubs. Mm -hmm. You pick your players from the big clubs because they're the better players. And it, I just found it absolutely soulless. I found myself mm -hmm. going and watching games mm -hmm. and thinking, why am I here? I watched a game once at Highbury between Arsenal and Chelsea. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm England manager. This yeah. is an England, English Premier League game. Yeah. And Amy Jackie, the French manager, was, I think, three, four seats down. Mm -hmm. And I said to Derek exactly. I looked at the team sheet and I said, we've got one player on the pitch today, English. And I counted the French players and they had 13. And, you know, and people are saying, you know, why don't you, why, why aren't we winning games? I'm saying because uh, we're actually helping the French and now, now very much the Spanish, a lot of their players playing. A lot of the English players haven't been playing for years. You can't win or qualify easily for a World Cup when a lot of your team, not all of it, but a lot of your team, aren't playing week in, week out mm -hmm. in any key positions in any of the big or small clubs in the Premier League. So, you know, when you really think about it, you'd have to be unbelievably lucky mm -hmm. to get an England side to win a tournament when you look at what you're playing against, you know, which is quality. What do you think the situation is now with England? I, I don't think it's that different, to be honest with you. You know, if, don't? if you, I don't, no. I mean, it, to, to, to have a really good team, I'm not even talking about at international level, I'm talking about anywhere, hockey, uh, football, at any level, um, certainly, rugby. I think, wherever I've been successful, we've had five top-class players. Hamburg, we had five top-class players. Liverpool, we probably, if I'm honest, had seven. Yeah. Um, Newcastle, the team I got promoted with, which was a division down, we had five really good players, top-class players in that division. If you've got that, the other six don't have to be top, top class. They can be good players and the five others will win the matches and the others will help when they can. Mm -hmm. But if you look at England now, truthfully, I can't give you five top class players. You know, uh, I, Steven Gerrard is a top class player. I think Ashley Cole has proven. It'll, it'll make his under the cap same time as Steven Gerrard. Mm -hmm. They're proven. And mm -hmm. I think Joe Hart, the goalkeeper, mm -hmm. and Rooney. Okay. So they need, you need more than that. You know, the Spanish, the Barcelona side, you're looking, they've got five great players. The Spanish side, they've got five great players. The German side, you've got five great players. So this is a big problem. So Roy Hudson's got a similar problem to myself. And he may get away with it in the friendlies and the qualifying. But when you come to the big tournament at the end, a bit like when a tennis player luckily qualifies for Wimbledon, when the seeds come in, 
it's a bit different. And I think England are going to have to, they're a long way off winning a major tournament, that's for sure. And I don't say that lightly, but it's, it's, it's the truth. And uh, only, only a fool would probably argue with you on, on any evidence that you can see. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Man City, for example, uh, they've got Milner and Barry and Lescott, who are English. Yeah. But don't be surprised if they're not in the team this weekend. They could be sitting on the bench. Well, you don't learn a lot sitting on a bench. It doesn't help your confidence sitting on the bench. And then someone says, right, I know you've been sitting on the bench for two weeks. Come and play against Germany in Munich. It's, it's a bit of an ask. <laughs> so that's the problem with England still for, for Roy Hodgson. Mm -hmm. um, not enough English players. And it's a kick up the backside for these young English youngsters to be like we were when we were kids, be a bit more hungry and say, what are you going to do about it? Don't say, oh, these foreign people are coming and taking all our jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, they're going to keep coming because mm -hmm. that's where it is. What are you going to do about it? And that's the big question that's being asked. And there aren't the right answers coming yet for me in England. What are you going to do about it? Are you just going to let it happen and use it as an excuse? Or are you, are you going to get as, good, as fit as they are? Are you going to work as that, spend as much time on the field as they do? Because that's what gets you to the top. There's no shortcut. There's no quick fix. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it in my life and in anything. So that's what they've got to do. So come on, guys, what are you going to do about it? Coming up with Kevin Keegan on Stadium Unplugged. When you get to 33, I call it you're on the glass mountain. You know, you're still trying to run up, but it's made of glass and you're not yeah. getting anywhere, you know. And then you suddenly start to tumble. When they booed us off that night, I thought, I'm not really doing, I'm not really getting anywhere with this group of players, with my style let someone else have a go.